guys, we're going to talk about the family. The family, we are the family. Now we're going to talk about the group you put together back in 1984. Oh, wow. With the family great, you'll find out and see. Hey, Prince. Yeah? I went shopping today, and I got something I want to give you. Really? Okay, close your eyes. It's a big surprise. Look, there you are. See, Mr. Ants can't have all the fun. What? What? No way. No way. This is real. This is real. Can I play it? See? Oh, look at that. Look at that. I'm going to join Morris's group. What? I said I'm going to join Morris's group. Say that again, bitch. I'm going to join Morris's group. Hey, pimp slap. Yes. I told you. Don't make me hit you with my purple psychedelic pimp slap. What about the guitar I gave you? Ah, I broke that shit. All right. Seriously, let's move on. Okay, guys. Got a review to do here. You ain't talking about me. It's enough. Morris sold me out. I don't need you selling me out, too. All right. Okay, guys. Welcome back. Um, yeah, Mr. Ants. Yeah, I got my own um, yellow cloud guitar. You know, even though um, Prince One bit bit the other, the living shit out of Prince Two of it for joining Morris's group. Okay. Um, I'm just doing this because everybody's putting these jokes in their videos now. And I think 2020. You know, I mean, Prince has been gone now for nearly four years. You know, and it's time. You know, it's never funny when a right artist you love dies, but you know, we just sometimes we've got to see the humour in some things, and I think the skits are quite funny, you know, yeah. But um that's for you, Mr. Ants, because I actually didn't bitch slap anybody when you got your guitar basically. No one threatened to join Morris's group. Okay, we're gonna talk about the family. And to me the family is very important because it's a very overlooked part of Prince's history really. In a lot of ways, when people think of Prince and his protege groups, they always think of the time, they always think of various revolution members doing their spin offs like Des Dickerson. And Sheila E, of course. And um, this is my 10th classic video. I went for the family. Okay, now the family are a hardly known project at all, really. I mean, they had one big album that kind of went away in a flash. But why I'm going to talk about this album is because I consider it a magnificent album. I mean, seriously, I mean, the songs on this album, basically, it was top-rate material. Prince gave some of his finest stuff into this album. I mean, there's basically no bum tracks on this whole album. I mean, okay, there's two instrumentals, but even they're really good in a lot of ways, so... Who are the family in this talk about? First of all, most of you who are big time fans probably know who these cats are. Basically here we've got Jelly Bean, we've got Susanna Malvoin, who was Prince's girlfriend from 84 to 87, and Prince wrote songs like, you know, Big Tall Wall, The Beautiful Ones, you know, Crystal Ball, and many other great songs, Um, you know, Nothing Left to Give, Train, Witness for the Prosecution, all these beautiful songs about a strange relationship. Then we've got here, we've got Eric Leeds, who basically played the sax and the trumpet for it, and it was just amazing. St. Paul, who was lead singer, and of course Jerome Benton, who was given the job after, you know, the whole time blew up. Now, what started the family, basically? Basically, what happened was, um, in July, June 84, when the time pretty much broke up, that's after Morris Day left the group. You know, of course, I mean, all the roots of the Senate going all the way back to basically, well, when I fired Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis for doing outside shit, I said, don't do no outside shit. Morris had to learn the hard way, but, and besides, look what it did, made them big stars. Okay, but, um, so basically that left, um, with what was left at the time, Morris left, then Jesse left, and that left St. Paul in charge. And basically St. Paul was this, you know, really cute white guy, basically running this sort of black funk group, basically. And of course, basically a lot of other cats left the time, basically Mark Cardenas, Rocky Harris, okay, he was already gone, sorry, yep, and, um, Whoever the other, that's it, Jerry Hubbard left the group as well. So all that basically left was Jelly Bean, because he needed the bread, as he put it. And basically Jerome, along with St. Paul. So Prince decided, look, we need to make a new group out of these guys, because these guys are working for me. They've shown me their loyalty. Purple Rain's coming out. It's going to blow up. I mean, St. Paul wasn't in Purple Rain, basically, but still. This shows some loyalty. I mean, OK, I've got Susanna now. She's on Wendy's sister. She has some musical talent, okay, she's not Wendy, but she can sing, so let's put her on an album, and, well, I've met Eric, and he's putting his horns and shit everything, because he's my manager, Alan's brother, because Eric Leeds was Alan Leeds' brother. As you know, Alan Leeds was basically Prince's manager from 83 to 88, and, of course, um, before that, he managed James Brown, so Prince pretty much, when you hired him, said, look, get me that James Brown guy. So he thought, okay, the time is gone, the time was really successful, they had their big R&B hits, and basically Prince said, look, I need a new band to do the time, but he decided that, 
maybe because there were more white people in the group, there's only two black people, and one of them really didn't do anything except dance around and hold a mirror. You know, we needed to go for a wider sound. And Prince was also watching groups like Duran, Duran, Depeche Mode, Soft Cell, all this new wave, new romantic stuff, you know, Devo, and realising, hey, how about if I write some white pop music? Maybe that'll sell volumes too. So basically you thought, you know, you could remake St. Paul into this beautiful, sexy um, singer. St. Paul wasn't actually that keen about it because he was from a Catholic family, despite the Scandinavian name. And he didn't really want to do the whole sort of sex angle. But Prince said, look, you could be like Rudolph Valentino. You know, there were girls weeping at his funeral. And St. Paul thought, okay, well, it's going to get me some bread. I might as well, because he was still very young. He was still only like 19, 20 years old. And already had watched his first band, The Time, break up around him. So... Prince said, OK, we're going to start this group called The Family. And Prince being Prince, you know, basically, pretty much Purple Rain had only just come out and Prince had already gone into the studio and started cutting the music. Pretty much, even though the album says, you know, produced and arranged by Bob David Z and The Family, you know, um, and the songs were written by The Family and Bobby Z. In reality, Prince wrote seven of the eight songs on the album. River Run Drive was apparently written by um, Bobby Z as well. And of course, Bobby Z's brother, David Z, otherwise David Rivkin, produced the album and pretty much worked with the Peterson brothers and uh, other people. So basically, he had this group and basically Prince went into the studio with um, and recorded basically the backing tracks to all the songs between June 84 and um, August 84. The first songs to get taped were High Fashion, Mutiny, Susanna's Pajamas, which first started life as a jam called Maserati, because at the same time, Prince had started up. Prince had taken over Brown Mark's group Maserati and was giving them 100 miles per hour. But that got changed to BMW and eventually became Susanna's Pajamas. And then um, Desire was also cut OK in July 84, of course. The classic version of Nothing Appears to You was cut, and that was the version that was released on the limited release single, Prince's version. And then, of course, The Family came. And then um, Yes, basically, which was the instrumental, and River Run Dry were recorded in early of August 84. In late August, Screams of Passion was the last song taped. And as you know, you've also got that, you know, sort of originals version and the um, rehearsal version here in the bootlegs where Prince is going, the less he touches it, the more it does, you know, and going, drop, drop out the organs, everybody play bass notes on the organs, that version basically was really good with Prince doing his singing, okay. So basically we got some first rate songs, the next thing Prince had to do was assemble a group. By September 84, he had the whole group together, basically he brought um, Paul and, Su and Susanna into the studio to sing all the overdubs and they came in and did it. Also, there were a lot of backing musicians in this group that weren't mentioned, and one of the most important ones of them was Miko Weaver, who basically put guitars on it. Because remember, all you basically had was two singers, a drummer, a man playing saxophone, and basically a guy just jumped around the stage acting the goat. So realistically, you actually needed some musical backing. You listen to songs, you got guitars, you got bass, you got keys. So basically, and then basically also brought in was a guy called Alan Flowers, who, who played the bass for Prince. Of course, Prince recorded all the instruments, but these caps were born just to do them. Prince realised straight away that Miko Weaver was one hell of a guitarist, basically. And of course, you know, now with, um, but he already had Wendy playing the guitar, basically. So he didn't need two superstar guitarists at this time. But he kept them around, basically. And then, of course, there's also a rumour, too, that Miko was also playing guitars on the other great 1985 production, Sheila E's second album, Romance 1600. And let me tell you now, this is Classics 10, Classics 11. I'm going to talk about Romance 1600. I'm sorry I didn't talk about Glamorous Life. I don't have a copy of the album, but I'm definitely going to seek one out because I really want to review Romance 1600 because it's an awesome album and I've had it for years. Okay, so, and then also, too, there were two keyboard players. Um, one of them you probably already know, Jonathan Malvoin, who Prince gave, you know, that session to record all the noises for Around the World in a Day. He was basically playing the keyboards, and, of course, you know, he was in the job, too, because we already had Susanna, and Wendy and Prince's groups, now we had Jonathan on the background role too. And then, of course, um, another guy called Carruthers, who was also playing keyboards. And Greg and Wally were brought on as back, backing dancers, probably to go with Jerome. So you had this whole group. All the music was recorded, OK? In late 1984, Prince enlisted the service of one Mr. Claire Fisher. And he came in and put strings on everything. I mean, proper strings, not twine on a plastic guitar. Um, and, um, of course, this was the first time Prince worked with Claire Fisher. Claire Fisher, as you know, I mean, basically put all the strings on Parade, Sign of the Times, and many of his classic albums. And Prince pretty much worked with him up to his death and then worked with his son, Brett Fisher. The other funny thing, too, about Claire Fisher was the fact that Prince never, ever met the man in person. He wanted to keep his um, identity secret. Prince would merely give tapes of stuff send them off to um, Claire, and Claire would put strings and stuff on them and give them a real sort of operatic feel. It was all part of the whole idea of the family was to give this music 
a real pop sound, but to also give it a wee bit more depth from way from straight ahead R&B and funk. Part of the reason too was that by 1984, Prince had kind of dropped the whole sort of black funk R&B soul roots, and had definitely seen that he could make much more money out of playing white style pop music. Ain't that right? You know, no afros, just guitar and funk. People buy my records. Yeah, you just selling out. You gotta play it real and funky like I play it. Listen, brother, you got your music, I got mine. Okay, you two need to knock it up. Oh, no, he's just a young hothead. He don't know what he's talking about. See, I got that third eye. He don't even have sunglasses. What I do have, though, is licks and notes. And I'm going to hit you with them. So, um, that's what basically happened there. So now we had basically a full package. And, of course, like everything else, because Prince was putting around the world in a day, and, of course, this was October 84, so Prince went out and did the Purple Rain tour. As you know, that burnt him out, basically. Things got put on the shelf for a while, and finally in April and May of 85, Prince decided to go take the album and put it into mixing. By this stage, I mean, Paul Peterson had virtually almost left, basically. And um, anyway, Prince decided, no, we're going to put this shit out anyway, you know, because he'd already done some more Jill Jones tracks. He'd done most of Parade by this stage. He'd done the Sheila E album. And, of course, now he was also working on the Maserati album. But he decided he did it, so in May 85, the whole thing got mixed, basically. Some overdubs were put on it. And finally, the first thing to come out of the family was in July 1985, on July the 19th, and July the 12th, actually, in Britain, the first single, Screams of Passion, came out. And the Screams of Passion is an amazing song, but for some reason, it was never, ever really promoted. They made some missteps of it, first of all. I mean, they could have put one of the other smoking hot songs, like High Fashion, Mutiny, or Desire, as a B-side. Instead, they put the rather lame instrumental Yes, which generally is the lesser of the two instrumentals. Susanna's Pajamas is much better. And um, But still, the Screams of Passion is an amazing song. The only problem with it, though, was it was never promoted. It only got to, like, number 63 on the American charts and number 34 on the black chart. As a result, it didn't really sell. Prince didn't have the family, you know, working as a live performing group. He didn't put them on the Purple Rain tour. He wasn't letting them play with them on the birthday parade. And as a result, the song, the song pretty much tanked with very little notice. What I reckon probably happened was because Prince and um, St. Ford had a falling out, Prince had just generally lost interest in the project. And then, of course, in August itself, out came the album. And the album itself came out on the 19th of August. Sorry, the 15th of August. It entered the charts on the 7th of September and climbed all the way up to number 62 on the white chart, which, considering how well Romance 1600 did, which got into the 30s, um, and all the Purple Rain era albums, I mean, this album only did as well as Apollonia 6, basically. It only stayed in the chart for about 10 weeks. It did better on the black chart, getting up to 17, but realistically, Prince wanted a white Duran Duran pop sound, so he didn't really want it again, only hitting on the black chart, so he was quite disappointed with that. They played one show to promote it, that was at um, 7th Avenue on um, basically the 13th of August, sorry, 1st Avenue. The show went down quite well, but as I know, I think, they, I think they, don't even, if they did play the main room, they didn't play 7th Avenue entry. But still, it was the only time they appeared on stage live. Now this, this show apparently was really good, it had everyone on stage, it had Jerome, it had Wally and Greg on it, they had um, the two keyboard players, Dark, and Miko was on stage playing guitar. Basically, Paul and Susanna were changing leads, and of course, you know, it was a real show. Now, let me show you what this album looks like. So, this is what the cover looks like, and um, what this video is. And so, we've got these silly photos, you know, mainly showing them around some mansion. Again, we're trying to promote this whole sort of glamour in France thing. We've got some hilarious ones here of Jerome sitting in a bathtub full of flower petals. Susanna looking sexy. I can only guess who's actually taking the photos here. I'll give you a clue. Yes, I think you know who took those photos. Don't she look fine in that window shape? Oh, Susanna, why did I ever lose you? You know, because she white, man. You need to go out with a fine ass sister. That's what you need to do. You know, yeah. And, um, yeah. And, um, yeah, so this is what the inside looks like. And you've got the back cover shot here. Now, on the insert, what you actually got was this um, very interesting picture of Paul standing on veranda. He does look very pretty boy, doesn't he? Yeah. Probably a bit more pretty boy than Prince on the back's pink. So I mean, it's sort of a sort of a kind of a feminine gay feel almost coming across with the style of the presentation. The record itself was more pink. One thing I want you all to focus on though was for the first time ever, whereas all the protege albums had come out on Warner Brothers, now we had Paisley Park. Part of Prince's new cloud after Purple Rain was now he got given Paisley Park, and basically Paisley Park he decided even though he was still signed to Warner's and these records still had the Warner's imprint, is that basically all of his um music and all of his protege stuff came out on paisley park 
It was the same with um, Sheila E's Romance 1600 and every protege album from this point onwards. Okay, so that's your album basically. Um, let's talk about the songs. Okay, there's eight songs on this album. Six are basically full fleshed out songs and four are basically instrumentals. Just before I do, final thing too, the second single was actually released off the album and that was released in December 1985 when interest in the project pretty much died off and that included um, High Fashion was Nayside and that's really good, that's a great song. Now you think of a song like High Fashion, the way they played together, they could have put Mutiny on as a B-side. No, what did they put on the B-side? Susanna's Pajamas. Obviously Prince was not interested in promoting this project. By December 1985, the um, family had pretty much disbanded. St. Paul had gone his own way. And everyone else in the group had been drafted into the basically the uh, um, super revolution, which now included Jerome, Wally and Greg as backing dancers. Susanna came in as a co-lead vocalist, basically. And of course, um, Jelly Bean left as well. And um, Eric was with Atlanta Bliss playing in the horn section, basically. And of course, Miko joined in on guitar. And as you know, I mean, all the others pretty much get fired before 1987, but Miko played with Prince up until 1990. And um, yeah, basically, so there you go. So that's what happened. Okay, let's talk about the songs on this album, because they are great songs. Okay, the first song, the album opens up with High Fashion, and High Fashion is easily one of the funkiest and most coolest grooves Prince ever made. It's got some great vocals. Now, the only thing I have to say about this album is that generally I'm not that happy with um, St. Paul's vocals. They're just a wee bit too try-hardy. I think the problem with what Prince was trying to do is he was trying to make him sound far too much like Prince or Morris when he was a skinny little white boy. I mean, high fashion, when you listen to the lyrics, it's about a spoiled bitch, basically, you know, stuck up little witch girls, quite funny. Now, it's almost kind of about Mary Sharon and Under the Cherry Moon. It's got such lines as, cheap liquor never touches her lips, her brandies imported every week, no problem, 7,000 easy. High fashion is where her money goes, high Fashion, this girl's all the way though. She's never in the low class world. High fashion, stuck up little rich girl. <laughs> Wonderful song, one absolutely one of my favorite ones. Has some really funny jive lines which you can almost hear coming out of Morris Day's mouth going. She had the nerve to ask what kind of car I had. I said, honey, I'm riding in the back of a Rolls Royce limo, custom painted play. You know, really funky, great song. What a way to open an album basically. And that flows into Mutiny which is just as good. And this is now about the same rich bitch as left him. Baby, when you went away, you stayed away too long. Mutiny, I'm stuck in over. You gotta get up this ship. You gotta get a little trip. Really funky songs about dealing with breakup, basically. And the thing about these two songs is that they, they flow together really well. I mean, they're just a real slamming up in this album. I mean, had they promoted this album, this would have easily gone top 20 pop. These are first-rate songs. I mean, if you haven't heard The Family, you need to try and find this down. I mean, I found this thing bloody hard around 2012, 2013. It was cheap, but now I imagine if it came up, it would be worth more. I mean, it's probably quite rare. This is actually a promo copy. And, um, yeah. But, of course, there are also Prince versions of these songs. Prince played these at his birthday parade concert, I think it was. I mean, there's a part, you know, where he sing them on stage, and it's just um, amazing songs. Then, of course, we've got The Screams of Passion, and that was the first single, and that's got some really good screaming in it. And just for you, Mr. Mr. Um, Purple Music, you know. There's a gentle autumn breeze that blows when we be lying, lying on my bed. Oh, touch me, baby, the screams of passion. Yeah! 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 Screams of passion. Yeah! Yeah! It's just hilarious, you know. It's basically about people having sex and screaming out in vocal acrobatics. It's a classic Prince song. You know, again, I mean, I think... Prince was trying to make St. Paul sound like him. I mean, Prince singing Screams of Passion, I think you've all heard it, it's just fucking incredible. Amazing song, you know. So basically, we've had three really good songs on the first side. I mean, this is this is easily 9 out of 10 stuff, basically. If it was Prince singing, there might be 10 out of 10. Or even getting Morris Day to sing High Fashion, I mean, imagine what that would sound like. And then we get into Yes, and Yes is, it's alright, I guess it is instrumental. It's very heavy on the horns. I mean, they really were giving Eric something to do in the music, you know. But what I like about Yes is the strings have been put on, and I think maybe because it's um, Claire's first real attempt at stringing a Prince album. I mean, it's just a wee bit too heavy, but at the same time, you can definitely hear precursors of the Flesh and Madhouse music here. This is definitely Prince's mind being expanded by, you know, Eric, Atlanta, and Lisa, and Wendy, 
and trying to take his music in these different directions. He was into a lot more jazz. There's definitely some Miles Davis type stuff coming through here. So I mean, even though I'm not a big fan of Yes, I appreciate the direction of the song. I appreciate Prince is really trying to blow out his repertoire. Like I said with Around the World in the Day, this was just a time when Prince was just expanding in every horizon. See, my mind was open, you know, just like the clouds on my thing. See, I was floating through time. I wasn't stuck in a time world. What are you talking about? I recorded music in the 2010s. You're recording stuff from the 80s. How can you say you're more advanced than me? I'm more advanced than you. You're also a lot cheekier than me. Do I need to bitch slap you with my guitar again? Don't make me come down there. Yep, so, um, and then we flip the record over and we get into River Run Dry. And this song I kind of like too, but it's got some very good call and response vocals. You know, but it's actually not bad. I mean, it starts off so, but then it gets really funky, basically. I mean, you can definitely tell it's not a Prince song. Still, I like it, though, but it's not as strong as the other songs on. So, I mean, like I said, we've had three strong songs in a row. And then we get two more really strong songs coming out. We've got Nothing Compares to You, I mean. Already, I mean, it's just probably one of the greatest songs ever written by anyone, I mean. And, of course, this one, again, is that Claire Fish has really gone to town. I mean, there's definitely more soaring strings in it. I mean, Paul's vocals are really pushed up. Apparently, there's stories that Paul and Susanna were just recording take after take after take in the studio. Prince just wanted it to sound absolutely perfect. And they come close, but still, I mean, it's nothing compared to basically hearing Sinead or Prince sing the thing, basically. It's still, it's a magnificent song. I mean, it's basically about a couple who have broken up and they need to get back together badly. I mean, again, it's just a magnificent song. And then, of course, we've got Susanna's Pajamas. Now, like, yes, this is another very funky sort of madhouse flesh thing. You've got a lot of horns coming through. You've got Sheila on the drums. Prince is definitely on the guitars and bass. There's some really good keys coming through. And it's just actually longer, better, and it's more in your ear. It's more, it's more filling the room up with music. I mean, what you need to do, you need to put this on some high-definition speakers and just blast the room out with it. I mean, basically, I mean, of course, and it's a jam you can tell Prince has worked on. Yes, kind of sounds like it was rushed onto the record, but... Susanna's Pajamas, remember Prince started off calling it Maserati, then it became BMW, and then finally became Susanna's Pajamas. Obviously, maybe Prince saw Susanna in his pajamas, and that inspired him to make all this funky music, or excitement or something. And I like it. And then finally, last song, Desire. Now this, again, this is a beautiful ballad. I really like this song, and I've said this about every song on the album so far. But Desire starts off with some amazing call and response vocals. It starts off with um, Paul going, so long have we known each other. And then you hear Susanna go, So long have we known each other. So little do we know. So little do we know. And it's like this dong 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 Just the singing. Okay, this is the one time where I say Paul and Susanna really bring it home with the singing. I mean, they, they convince us here. This is two people that are in love. They're in the, like, again, it's, a lot of the music on this album, realistically, the second side is a lot about people having sex and getting together. Basically, sex keeping a relationship together. It's beautiful. It's basically music for lovers, you could say. Like, it's definitely a lot softer than what was going on Princess albums. It's not so full of the social conscience songs. There's no pop life type songs on this album. This is just basically natural. This is almost rootsy. It's white sounding, but the themes are very black, very, you know, get down R&B you know, bedroom soul, but given a real white pop polish on it. And, you know, and the, and the chorus in the song, it just shimmers, it goes, Desire recovers our faces. It happens in curious places. Your body, it covers my tower. Ecstasy is ours. I dream of a physical evening. Dum -bum -bum. I long for a night within you. So they're actually really dirty lyrics. I mean, Tao was referring to it as, well, you know what? You don't need to define what it means. Yeah, we're Prince fans. We know what that shit means. Yeah, please don't define that stuff. And you put 25 cents in the swear jar. I don't appreciate you using the S word. Oh, I forgot about you getting into that JW shit. That's another quarter. Okay, so there you are. Eight amazing songs, you know. Why? One question I just have to ask about this whole album. Why in God's name did Prince not promote this group? This is strong as the time, stronger than most of Sheila E stuff, much stronger than Vanity Apollonia 6. This is well-crafted pop music, you know. The presentation and the finishing on it is best ever. I mean, Prince put Claire Fisher all over it, you know. This stuff has been polished like a diamond. I mean, it barely reached the charts, and that's the biggest injustice about it. I mean, and yet, even today, you ask a lot of Prince fans. I know there are a lot of Prince fans out there. They love Prince. They are raw about him, but they don't give a flying 
don't you dare say that word. You're going to, if you're going to say that F word, I'm going to charge your ass a whole dollar. You just said us. It's 25 cents. No, that's only a damn word. Whatever. Okay. But this album, wow. I mean, I know I can't go in deep and talk about the mastering levels and the EQ levels of, you know, clear, clear, you know, Fisher's strings next to, you know, I'm Paul and I'm Susanna doing call and response vocals, but there's just so much cream on this record and yet it's just so ignored. Overall, we've got to give this thing some marks, okay? As far as sheer songwriting chops goes, okay, I know it's Prince's songwriting, but the quality of the songs and the material easily 10 out of 10, no question. I mean, songs like High Fashion, Mutiny, Desire, The Screams of Passion, Nothing Compares to You. These are songs that are just absolutely top-notch Prince songs. They could appear on any of his albums. They probably didn't appear on any of his albums at the time because they didn't really fit the feel. Maybe they might have made it onto Parade, but, you know, Parade was still a wee bit off in the future. This is more 84, 85. Parade's more 85, 86. Okay, the actual performances. I mean, when I talk about performances, I mean, okay, the musical performance, 10 out of 10. I mean, definitely, um, because Prince is playing all the backing music, but vocal-wise, I can't give it more than about a 7. I mean, their voices are average at best. Like I said, the only song where their voices really come together is on Desire. Maybe on... um. Nothing compares to you two, they're trying really hard, and I think the screams of passion definitely, I mean, Susanna's screaming, it's almost as good as mine, basically. Definitely not as good as Prince's, so, um, so yeah, there's definitely a lot to like on this album. Overall, I'm going to give this album 8.5 out of 10. No, that's too low, I'm going to give it 8 and 3 quarters. This is a solid A record. Not quite as good as Around the World in a Day, but definitely much better than What Time Is It. It's probably on about the same level as What Time Is It, basically. Sorry, I mean, Ice Cream Castle is not what time is it really wrong, you know, but... And I think, you know, it's a very overlooked record. Now, like I said, what happened to the time after? It's like you said, there's only the one show. Apparently, sometime in August, September 85, Prince was flying back and forth to France. He was shooting on the Cherry Moon. St. Paul, Paul Mustaine said, look, we've got a great album out there. What are you doing to promote it? And he said, well, I did... I said, I'm still going to make your start. I did it with Sheila E. I did it with the time. And you know, then, then apparently Paul said, look, you can't be doing 10 million things together at once. St. Paul left Prince's fold. Without him, I mean, basically the presence of the project fell apart. And of course, apparently he's still in the working in the Twin Cities era, producing other artists, working with um, David Z, Bobby Z, and of course his other brother, um, Ricky Peterson, who kind of, you know, played around with Prince and other groups at the same time. And um, apparently the Petersons had a reputation as a very musical family. Now, the rest of the group, apart from Jelly Bean, who split pretty much, I think he went off to work with um, Jam and Lewis pretty much. And I mean, I think, and I'm not sure, but I think he almost... Probably also did some work with Morris Day, who was touring for his own solo shit at the time. And um, basically everyone else got drafted into the revolution. We had the counter-revolution, of course, you know, that leads to Parade. Now, I'm not going to do a classic series on Parade, for one good reason. If you go onto my playlist, you'll see that back in 2016, I did a 30th anniversary introspective on Parade, and pretty much the story from now picks up from there. This will be the last classics video, except for a quick one I will do about Sheila E's Romance 1600, because that really was the second of the 1985 Paisley Park releases. And unlike this album, I mean, Romance 1600 went on to be quite a big hit. I mean, it was a bigger hit than Glamorous Life. I mean, Sister Fate and um, A Love Bazaar were big hits, and of course, you know, even after that, she still hit big with um, Holly Rock off Crush Groove. So that's the family. I think you should get into it now. Just before I do finish up, I just want to do some big thank yous. First of all, I really want to do a massive thank you to Mr. Fuzzy Face. I know I've got your name right this time, I think. What you did with your Twitter thing, I think it worked because I think the number of views of that video went up from about 45 up to like 90. Okay, even I can't believe how big that last video did. It got 90 views. And all I basically did was just talk about basically why we like Prince. Okay, I know it's a good thing, but I didn't expect it to do quite so well. I mean, I'm just very pleased and... um. I just want to thank everybody who watches and subscribes to my videos. I want to thank Prince's Friend and um, Mr. Rance for putting out some absolutely hilarious and really well-written stuff. I mean, Prince's Friend, I love a rabid 80s fan. I mean, you should really keep in mind, you should really get him doing some more stuff. Yeah, I know that, you know, getting your ruffled shirt out looking good and getting the purple rain board up behind his hard work, but it's worth it. Everything rabid 80s Prince fan says is just hilarious. Okay, so the rest of you, thank you for watching my stuff. Take care. May you live to see the dawn. And um, these two here, we might put them back in their box next time. Maybe I need to put you back in your box. Yes. For once I agree with the young whippersnapper. Young whippersnapper, I am Prince. You were Prince. I am Prince. Amen.